Pope Joan, Pope John, that could work. And then there's the existence of this um, seat in St. Paul's outside the walls. And remember, this is one of the four papal basilicas, uh, and this was in the choir where it is now. The, the Catholic Church has long since gotten rid of it in St. Paul's, St. Paul's outside the wall. But of course, the legend was that there's a hole. And so after the whole Pope Joan thing, an order, as soon as someone was, had enough votes to become Pope, they were asked to sit in this seat, and the senior uh, cardinal in the College of Cardinals was asked to reach up and confirm <laughs> that there would never be another Pope Joan again. <laughs> and so they called this, uh, and this actually, what, what we think now, this, we think this is an imperial birthing chair. This is what the, the, the empires and I guess empresses would have sat in to, to, to give birth back in, in the olden times, I guess. So that was, a, that was my homework. <laughs> Your homework. I asked you all to become uh, criminologists, right? So back when the Soviet Union was a Soviet Union, the only way that we knew who was next in line was who was sitting next to who at the funerals. And with the Catholic Church, which is sometimes as uh, opaque as, as the Communist Party in Russia, that right as gay could probably tell us all about, we have to read the tea leaves. So there were some tea leaves that we could have read over the last two weeks uh, that, that Pope Francis has done. Um, so uh, what has happened in the last two weeks? Um, the first thing that's happened is, this is the organization we talked about last week, and the Pope has added something to this organization. So there's now a reform panel up here. Right? So he's named eight people that is going to help him uh, come up with a reform plan for the church. And so it's important enough that there's another one of these consultative groups that's going to help him along with the College of Cardinals and the Synod of Bishops, and then of course the Curia. And so the reform panel is interesting in its own right, but it's even more interesting when we consider who's on the reform panel. These are all his, his selections. So this is the, the reform panel. So the only person from the Curia that's on the reform panel is the president of the government of the city-state of the Vatican. So he's an Italian, uh, and here's his photo. And then we have the former Archbishop of Santiago, who apparently is, is good friends with, with, with Pope Francis. And then uh, we go to India, where we have the Archbishop of Mumbai, or Bombay. And then we go down to Africa, where we have the Archbishop of Kinshasa, Congo. And then we come to the United States, right? Our very own Cardinal O'Malley from Boston is one of the folks on the reform panel. We go to Germany, uh, where we have the Archbishop of, uh, of uh, Munich. And then we go down to Australia, here we have the Archbishop of Sydney. And then we round it out with perhaps the most interesting pick, I think, is uh, the Archbishop in Honduras, right? Who is one of the folks who were talking a little bit about possibly becoming Pope. He's one of the young guys, so I suspect that his name will be surfacing uh, for future conclaves. Um, so lots of people from lots of different parts of the world, only one person from, from the Curia. So I think this is all sending us a signal that, that he takes reform quite seriously. So if we want to uh, revisit the, the hierarchy of the, of the Vatican, I think we might not want to put the reform panel up there, but rather we might want to put the reform panel <laughs> over everything for the power that they very well may yield here in the next uh, couple of years. So that was the one big change uh, that, that came from Pope Francis. And then uh, we have, right, the congregations, right? So these were the things that we think of as departments, so the Department of Energy or the Department of State. But in the, in, in the Vatican, of course, they, there's the Department of the uh, of the clergy, or the religious, or the saints, or the oriental churches. And remember that each one of these uh, congregations is headed by a cardinal prefect, is what they're known as. And then there's a secretary who's number two, and then there's an undersecretary. And so when the pope uh, became the pope, he um, reappointed all of them while he was considering what moves he was going to make. Um, and so uh, we have the prefects, and then the secretaries, and the undersecretaries. Um, so he's made uh, one change. So in the religious, here we now have a new secretary. And once again, it's not that interesting that, that, that he's replaced the secretary. He actually fills a vacancy that existed within the religious. Um, but it's who he replaced him with. So it's Archbishop Arcarballo, um, who is from Spain. And he was the, um, I want to get his title right, he's the Minister General of the Order of Friars. 
So he's a Franciscan, and the largest branch of the Franciscans, remember there are multiple branches, so he is in charge of the largest branch of the Franciscans. So taking perhaps uh, the namesake, uh, seriously, he's appointed to a Franciscan to a pretty high position. And Franciscans are a lot like Jesuits, um, and it's rare that they would serve in, in a hierarchical position within the Vatican. Um, so we're, we can read a little bit of tea leaves there. Um, and then, uh, so, so here's all of Benedict's people, and now we have one person <laughs> from the reign of, of Pope Francis. And then on Monday, this I think was the, uh, well, I think th this is a pretty obscure story. This is a little bit less obscure. Um, so we just had news breaking on Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you viewed the first two things perhaps as positive signs, if you're a reformist, this one is a little bit less positive. So Pope Francis reaffirms critique of the LCWR, the LCWR being the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. Well, of course, we all are familiar with the, um, uh, I don't want to use them, visitation. I was going to say investigation. We call them visitation that the Vatican has had with uh, the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. And, and what happened was that the leaders of the LCWR met with the um, prefects of the Doctrine of the Faith, who, uh, of course, was replaced, used to be um, a childhood friend of Letty's, used to be the prefect, so Cardinal Leveda, but he was replaced by a, um, a, a German, uh, Mueller is his last name, uh, Cardinal Mueller, and Cardinal Mueller, in his meeting um, with the head of the LCWR, uh, said that he, that Mueller, the Cardinal Mueller, had talked with Pope Francis about the, um, the visitation and that Pope Francis had confirmed and wants to go forward with the findings of the report and also with the, um, I want to use the words right, uh, the plan of action to get the LCWR back in line, back in the fold of the Vatican. Um, so we had a little bit of a uh, tea reading. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about, about American history. You want to ask a question already? Yeah. <laughs> Just because you're going to leave the international church. I am. I In fact, we're getting on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, and I will leave the Pope going aside for the moment, <laughs> since, the, since the College of Cardinals is the one that elects Pope, and even though there's a nunnery, and even though there are many female saints, what is the highest woman in the, in the, in the international Catholic Church? Because they are not voting. Right. And, and, and so there will never be a female Pope again. So clearly, <laughs> none, of, <laughs> none of these folks, none of these folks, or none of these folks are women. So the highest ranking women usually come in these curial agencies. Where they, it's rare that they will head, I think one may have headed one. Um, it's rare that they'll head, but it's frequent that they're number two. So a pontifical ab um, advisory <coughs> board on science, it wouldn't be at all rare for there to be a number two for women in that. In fact, interestingly, um, so we're going back uh, to papal news, or two ambassadors, so American ambassadors to the Holy See, and uh, Marianne Glendon, who is a law school professor from Harvard, uh, was number two at one of these curial agencies. And so we think that she may be one of only a couple of people who have ever worked for the government that she was later uh, an ambassador to for another country, um, because she had worked for the Vatican, but yet was an ambassador, an American ambassador, um, to, the, uh, to uh, the Holy See. Well, the point of my question is that since there is a nunnery, how come there is no woman that is on the council of Pope? Because Jesus chose all male followers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on a boat. <laughs> that boat is the Mayflower. And I think that, that uh, I think it's helpful to, to go all the way back to the Mayflower to understand a little bit about the Catholic Church's... Ooh. Yeah. Can't put it in my pocket. Um, going back to the Mayflower. So remember that the Puritans who left England weren't in search of religious freedom. Right? I think that's a pretty popular idea that, that uh, they were in search of religious freedom, so they were going to go to the United States where, there was gonna, where free freedom was going uh, to flourish. But remember the Puritans actually left England because they couldn't get along with the Church of England. 
And remember that the Church of England, then as now, is, is kind of a step away from Rome. I mean, depending on what part of history we're talking about, a pretty close step or, or a more distant step like it is today. And so with the Puritans, right, they couldn't stand the, Eng the Church of England, and however much they couldn't stand the Church of England, they, they couldn't stand the Catholic Church even more, right? So the, um, they left England to come to the United States in order to form a, a sect, really, right? They wanted to come to the United States and have the government endorse their pur puritanical views, right, the, the, pu the Puritan Code. And so the Puritans are, 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 the, are met um, uh, by other groups arriving from, from, Eng from England and other parts of, of, of uh, that area of Europe. And eventually we, we get the forming of these 13 colonies. Um, and when we think about the role that these 13 colonies had, even with respect to religion, the only one where we might have a slight Catholic story is here in Maryland. Right? So Maryland is, is founded by Lord Baltimore, who was Catholic. Um, uh, but quickly, after the forming of Maryland, Maryland, um, it, it becomes a pretty anti-Catholic place. Um, and it, it, I'm going to run through just some, some, some figures from the 13 colonies. So in only three of the colonies, could Catholics even vote? So in 10 of them, they were, they were forbidden from voting. In most of no, New England and the Carolinas, uh, they were forbidden from holding office of any sort. Um, priests, if they stepped inside Virginia, were arrested and prosecuted. Schools banned uh, Catholics from attending in every colony except for Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania was the only one that had a little bit of religious freedom. There was only one signer of the Declaration of Independence His name was, uh, who was Catholic. His name is Charles Carroll. Um, and in, incidentally, a side note to history, his brother was one of only five people that signed both the uh, Articles of Confederation and the U.S. Constitution. And we'll hear a little bit more about a carol here in a second. Um, and so Catholicism wasn't a part of the American at its founding. Um, and, it, and, as, and as much as it was, it was only because of the way that Catholics were, were being uh, persecuted. Um, but nonetheless, because of this early foothold into Maryland, um, we get uh, the election of a bishop in Baltimore in 1789. So shortly after the founding, at about the same time that we get the, uh, the U.S. Constitution, we get an, an elected bishop of Baltimore. And this is interesting. The only uh, bishop in the history of the United States that was elected. So when it was about time for the United States to get a bishop, the Pope couldn't be bothered with trying to figure out which one of the, the priests in the United States should become a bishop. Um, the, the, he allowed them to have an election. And whoever they elected, he would name them as bishop. But of course, we believe in in apostolic um, uh, succession very seriously in the Catholic Church. And so in order to become a bishop, you have to have your hands laid upon by three other bishops. And the reason that there are three is in, in case that succession was broken somewhere along the way, we could be certain that someone was, was laid upon uh, hands of someone and, and going back into history, tracing it all the way to an apostle. And that is the only way that, that we could be certain that this person could be bishop is if that apostolic succession has succeeded. So he has to travel back to Europe in order to officially become a bishop. Uh -huh. Who were that today? Uh, the, the priests here in the United States. Yep, so the priests that were uh, in, in the territory, the 13 colonies. Um, and so he uh, is, becomes the first bishop. Um, and in 1808, so less than 20 years later, uh, it becomes an, arch, an archdiocese. So an archdiocese, uh, we, we can think of them as, as being metropolitan uh, bishops. So bishops that, that are in charge of a general region in, in addition to being in charge of their particular diocese. Now I'll have more to say that about that in, in a bit. Um, but also in 1808, we get four additional dioceses. So we get New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and then a western diocese that, that was stationed in Bardstow, Kentucky. And then in 1821, kind of carved out from this Kentucky diocese, we get Cincinnati. In 1834, we get Indiana, also carved out in the same general area. And then we get Nashville and Detroit. So we see how the Catholic Church is spreading from that N New England corridor down into uh, the more southern and, and mid Midwestern parts of, uh, of the Catholic Church, and eventually reaching all the way to Chicago in 1843. And we get the Chicago diocese. But of course, I'm only talking about this area. But of course, that's what the United States consists of, of, of at that time. But there are Catholics all over this region that comes to be known as the United States. So I thought that I would just tell you a little bit about kind of 
Catholics in other regions. So in, uh, in Michigan, coming down through Quebec, we have, um, we have the Jesuits, um, and they, uh, they form churches, and, and actually where my family vacations a lot of time is Nacon Island, which is between the Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula. They established a church um, in, in the early uh, 18, or, uh, late 18th century, so late 1700s, um, called St. Anne. Mm -hmm. Place that we are on Nacon Island. Um, and there's an interesting story about Quebec. So, right, so Quebec is up here, and when we're starting to get the uh, spirit of revolution, we send delegates up to Canada to try and see if they want to join us um, in, 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 uh, in declaring their independence from, from England. Um, but it, a, a quirky thing happens in our conversations. In 1774, the Canadian government passes what's called the Quebec Act of 1774. And the Quebec Act um, is, is really an act about religious freedom. Um, and religious freedom to the colonists means allowing the Catholic Church to get its foothold into the new territory. And so there are all sorts of comics coming around here uh, about the same time. Here's the, the Quebec Bill, and you have a bunch of bishops who are dancing around the Quebec Bill happy that there's going to be religious freedom in Quebec, um, and so the Catholic Church will be able to get its foothold. So as soon as the Canadian government passes, or, or what comes to be known as the Canadian government passes this bill, um, the talks stop because the American revolutionaries would rather go it itself and not have any kind of Catholic uh, involved in, in, in what, what they're about up to. But also in, in um, California, we get <coughs> Unipera Serra, a Jesuit again, um, who is uh, instrumental in establishing a bunch of different missions. Uh, now, lots of these missions can you, continue uh, to exist. In California, Unipera Serra was a Franciscan. Was he a Franciscan? Yes. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Michigan. I guess I just believe the Jesuits are everywhere. <laughs> Franciscan. Right, it makes lots of sense. <laughs> there you go. So the first one that he establishes is in 1769, which is down here in San Diego. And then the second one is um, in, uh, in the middle of the state. And then the third one is over here. And so we get uh, the Franciscans establishing a bunch of missions along, <laughs> along uh, the California coast. But of course, the Catholic Church is not only in Michigan and in, uh, in that area, in the northern part of the United States. It's not only in California. Uh, oh, here's our, here's our guy, Francisco, here's our um, But it's also here in Texas, right? So we get the establishment of the mission of San Francisco in 1689. This, of course, by Franciscans. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we get Mission Concepcion in 1716. Uh, around the San Antonio area, right? exactly. And then in 1718, we get this one, the Mission San Antonio de Valero. Does anyone know a better name of that? Alamo. Alamo. Right, of course, it's Alamo. So the, the founding of the state in the area of Texas is it, critically linked with the history of the Catholic Church. In total, there are 26 missions that the Franciscans start in Texas. Um, in fact, during this time, of course, we have lots of, of Mexican influence. Uh, we're part of Mexico for a bit. And so a way, an easy way for settlers from the east to get property in Texas is, is to claim Catholicism as their heritage. So there's a time where Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin declare that they're Catholics <laughs> and get property for doing so. Um, in 1845, of course, Texas becomes a state. And then in 1847, it gets its own diocese in Galveston. So we're the, uh, and we're the next diocese. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eight, eight. So like the 12th or 13th diocese in the, in the history of the, the United States here. Uh, in, the United, in the New World. <coughs> um, and Catholic population is small, right? So in millions of people, it doesn't even register. And this was 1790 and 1820. Um, when we look at it as a percentage of the people living in the United States, in 1820, it's less than 2%. So there are very few Catholics in the United States. And in, in the Catholics that are here, even as we become our own country, and even, even as we believe in these things of separation of church and state, and, and the ability to practice our own religions, uh, Catholics are still continually persecuted in the early part of the United States. In 1834, uh, a mob burns down a, a convent, of all things. In 1844, there's uh, violence and death at a, at a series of churches in Philadelphia over an entire summer. In fact, it's that very act that leads to the professionalization of the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, in 1855, on a day known as Bloody Monday, in Louisville, Kentucky, 
Uh, there are 22 German and Italian Catholics who are killed. Um, and this is, you know, the mid-19th century, 1855. In 1856, there's a political party that's known as the Know Nothings uh, that, that, that becomes quite popular and it reaches its heyday in 1856. Uh, they form a platform that, if you read the platform, it sounds like nativism at, it, at its root, but there's also a strong anti-Catholic uh, aspect to their, their platform. There are severe limits on immigration, especially from Catholic countries. Uh, they want to restrict political office to native-born Americans of English and Scottish lineage, and Protestant persuasion is the way they put it. They want to mandate a 21-year waiting period before you can become a naturalized U.S. citizen. Uh, no, that's right, it really does sound familiar. They want to restrict public school teaching positions to only Protestants. Catholics need not apply. They want to restrict the sale of liquor which if you know anything about the Irish Catholics and Italian Catholics, that's not so key. And of course they want to restrict the use of language to only English in the United States. Um, so uh, the Know Nothings, here's their ticket of Fillmore and Donaldson. Miller Fillmore, former president, so they have quite a standard bearer. Native Americans be aware of foreign influence, right? You don't have to be very creative to come up with, with a strong anti-Papist sentiment, sentiment there. Um, here's the results of the election in, in 1856. So James Buchanan wins uh, with uh, 19 states. Millard Fillmore picks up a state in 21% of the vote. And interestingly, when we look at the, the map that, of course, we all stare at now every four years, the blues and the reds are a little bit different than <laughs> Maryland. Right? So the colony that was established by Catholics is the only one that votes for the Know Nothing candidate. So this is 1856, we get the Civil War, and in the next 50 years, there are four big things that start what I call mainstreaming Catholics. So Catholics are, are really persecuted, um, really up until the middle part of the 19th century, and there are four things that, that really change, uh, change this around. The first one of these is immigration. So the know-nothings lose, uh, the immigration law stays as they are, and we start seeing lots of people from Ireland, of course the potato famine. Uh, Germany, Italy, and then a little bit later as we get closer to 1900, we start seeing more even from Spain and Portugal. Um, and of course what we know about all of those countries is, is a strong Catholic uh, presence in those countries. So the first thing that happens that brings lots of, of, um, of Catholics to the United States is, is immigration. But of course this only gives the know-nothings the ability to be a nativist party instead of a, a, a stridently anti-Catholic party because they can be against the immigrant and not necessarily against Catholics, per se. The second uh, big thing that, that helps Catholics mainstream are labor unions. So at the same time that, we, that after we have the Civil War, we have the urbanization and we get the industrialization in the United States, and we also get the, the strong presence of labor unions in our big cities. We start getting the establishment of these, uh, of these uh, big boss systems in Boston and Philadelphia and New York, and a lot of them are built around the immigrant populations, uh, trying to appeal to the immigrants as they're getting off the boats. And they do so in an in a, in a, in a explicitly Catholic way. So the labor unions and, and, and the Catholic Church become integrally related to one another um, in American history. And, and you'll see, as we get later on in the talk, elements of, of, of that uh, even today. Um, the third thing uh, that really mainstreams Catholics in the United States is, is the nuns um, and, and their um, strong belief in, in health care. Um, so the nuns, even while the Civil War is going on, give Americans for the first time really a sympathetic face to the Catholic Church. Um, after the battles would, would be over, of course the soldiers would move on, uh, those that could would move on, uh, those that couldn't unfortunately would die, and it was the nuns who were going to the battlefields and burying the dead soldiers, and only the nuns. So it's really hard to be against a, an institution where for some of those that are the, are the very face of the institution are the ones that are burying all the dead on the battlefields during the Civil War. And this, this, uh, this heritage of, of health care is even continued today. These are all Catholic hospitals that continue to exist in the United States. Right, so they're all over, and of course we see quite a conglomeration here where we are. Um, and then the fourth great uh, mainstreaming um, aspect of the Catholic Church around this time is, is education. And once again, it's the nuns are primarily responsible for, for education. Um, to this day, there are 244 colleges in the United States that are Catholic. Uh, there's 28 law schools and six medical schools. So once again, strong heritage of the, of the Catholic Church, even persisting um, till today. 
So the Catholics are becoming a little bit more mainstream. Their population is rising. They're up to 15% of the population by the time we turn uh, to, the, to the 20th century. Um, but Catholics are still viewed um, through, a, through a particular <laughs> lens. And, and so I wanted to share with you some of the characteristics, the way that people would describe Catholics around the turn of the 20th century. So the first is that they're highly devotional. Um, and, and I was talking to my parents as I was driving down today from Austin, and we were talking about some of the ways in which this becomes manifest to people who aren't Catholic. So for those of you that are Catholic in the room, of course, no eating meat on Friday. Right? That's just something you don't do. You, you don't eat or drink an hour before you accept communion. Um, you always go to church every Sunday, the Sunday obligation. Right? So to, to people who aren't Catholic, all of these things seem like, like strict regiments or whatever. But it, it's extending all the way back to, the, to 113 years ago that, that this is becoming kind of what, what Catholics are to, to, to non-Catholics. They're morally rigid, um, right? And there are so many jokes going through my head from college that I won't tell. Um, right, but morally rigid. Uh, Catholics are, are, are known for, for their piousness, if you will. Um, for being intellectual but ambivalent. So in some of the great debates that are happening in the United States about this time involving evolution and, and science and stuff like that, Catholics are usually on the side of science against the, the, the Protestants and the more fundamentalists, um, but they're not very active in these debates. They're happy to, to sit back and let other people kind of have the debate, but yet they're generally on the side of science. They're institution building. Of course, we see that with hospitals and colleges, uh, and that, that continues today. And they're also insular. So again, I was talking to my mom. I grew up in a, in a small town of 2,000, but the biggest town next to us has about 32,000 people. And even in this, this town of 32,000, Bay City, Michigan, there are neighborhoods where the Polish Catholics live, and the Italian Catholics, the Hispanic Catholics, the German Catholics. And, and there's a church in each one of these neighborhoods. And if, if, if you're Italian, you don't live in the Spanish neighborhood, and you don't go to the Spanish church. You live in that neighborhood. And that's the way that the rest of, of, of non-Catholics are viewing Catholics about this time. So this is the early 20th century. In 1828, a huge event happens in the history of, of the Catholic Church in the United States, and that is the L. Smith. Uh, 1928. 1928. Um, L. Smith becomes the candidate of the Democratic Party. Uh, Al Smith doesn't do so good. Um, he loses, of course, to Herbert Hoover. Um, he only wins eight states. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we have our first um, candidate for president. Population continues to grow, uh, falls down a little bit in the middle part, but then picks up again by 1960. And of course, you know why I'm choosing 1960. For however big Al Smith is, uh, this guy's a little bit bigger. Uh, John Kennedy is the, is the Democratic nominee. And, and I don't need to, if there's a city that I don't need to tell the story of what happens less than two months before the election, uh, John F. Kennedy comes down to Houston addressing the Greater Houston Ministerial Association and convinces everyone that he is a president who happens to be Catholic rather than a Catholic president. Um, and this, this speech is seen as being critical for, uh, for his vote, um, uh, to get, for people to vote for him, um, and, it, and it's successful. Like I think most people regard that speech as one of the 50, 100 greatest speeches ever given uh, by an American. But he has to be very careful. He is Catholic, his, his family has very strong Catholic ties. In fact, his brother, the first time he receives communion, Ted Kennedy, it's by the Pope. Um, so there's, there's a strong kind of Catholic tradition in the family. And in, in, in 1963, he, he, he debates, and the entire administration debates whether or not he should meet Pope Paul. Right? But he decides to meet Pope Paul. This is on July 2nd, two days before uh, the 4th of July. He meets, and, and this is as close as we'll ever see the two of them get. <laughs> right, so, so Kennedy does not shake hands with the Pope, does not kiss the ring, the fisherman's ring, does not bow to the Pope, because of course any image of that being transmitted back to the United States would cause him a huge amount of tremendous grief. I mean, in fact, if you look at Kennedy, right, like he might as well be going to confession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of forgive me, Father, forgive me, Holy Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> a comfortable photographer. But this is right, so John Kennedy in, in, in 1960. Um, and and it's, it's interesting. So this is the Catholic vote in the two Eisenhower elections and the, and the Kennedy election. So Catholics are voting 55% Democratic and 52. They're just over 
50% in 56, um, but then they're almost all the way to 80% in, in, in 1960. Um, of course, it's only helpful if we know the Democratic vote, uh, the Catholic vote in relation to the American population vote. So this is how the American population is voting for Democratic candidates in 1952 and 56, so how they're voting um, for uh, Eli Stevenson. And then, in, of course, 1960, we have almost a, a split electorate in, in Democrats. Aren't. So instead of showing you the, the two columns, for the rest of the chart, I'll show you just the disparity between the Catholic vote and the rest of the American vote. So in 52 and 56, again, it's around 10%. So there's a pro-democratic bias, if you will, among Catholic. In, in 1960, it, it grows almost to 30%. So the way to read this is the Democrats are casting 30% more votes for the Democratic candidate than the rest of the United States. Um, and then we fast forward and we see the distinctiveness of the Catholic vote receding. So by the time we get to Ronald Reagan, he's, he's uh, Jimmy Carter in the 1980 election is getting 5% more um, than he did among the rest of the population. And Reagan actually does better among Catholics than he does the rest of uh, the United, the rest of the Americans who are voting in the election. Um, and then forecasting it all the way forward to 2012, we see a slight Democratic bias for the Democratic uh, voting. Um, but in 2012, uh, Barack Obama actually does worse among Catholics than he does among the rest of the population. So there is a strong kind of Democratic bias early, but the distinctiveness, the effect of, I think, John F. Kennedy wears, wears down. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's really interesting to look at, at the Obama vote by church attendance. So if you're a Catholic and you go to weekly mass, only about 42% of you are giving um, your vote to Barack Obama. If you go less often, <laughs> less often than weekly, then you're all the way up around 57%. What's interesting about this figure is when we compare it to other Protestants. So Protestants that are going to weekly services are giving less than 30% of their vote to Barack Obama. And if they go less often, then they're up around 45%. And you'll see this pattern play out whenever we look at any kind of data over the last 10 years with respect to Catholics and, and other Americans. And that if, if, if you're not a church attending Catholic, you act a lot like a non-service attending Protestant. So there's not much difference between these two. And the Catholics are always, the Catholics that attend regularly, always look more democratic or more liberal than the Protestants that attend services regularly. So even though, Right, Barack Obama does worse among Catholics generally. He certainly does better, much better among, uh, among uh, God-fearing or regular church-attending Catholics than, uh, than, among, than he does with Protestants. So I thought we should, we should look at some data of how Catholics practice their, their politics. Um, and so these are, are, are regular church-attending Catholics, non-regular church-attending Catholics, and then the same columns for non-Catholics. And once again, when we look at this column of non-church attending Catholics and non-church uh, attending Protestants, we see that the percentages aren't all that different. Um, and when we look at how Catholics who go to church, um, what they think about policy issues relative to the Protestants, I'll just read some of those for, for those of you that can't see. So with respect to abortion, 24% of Americans are, are, are accepting of abortion, only 19% of church attending Protestants. But of non-church going, it's 52 and 56. Uh, the death penalty is 52% for uh, regular Catholics, 66% for the Protestants who regularly go. Uh, having a baby outside of marriage, right? 70 and 67% of non-attending uh, um, Protestants and Catholics agree with that. Almost 50% of Catholics and 29% of Protestants. So Protestants are always the most conservative, and then regular church attending Catholics. But then the non-attending uh, folks are, are pretty similar. So let's look a little bit about the institution that I, that I studied. So if you go back to the 87th Congress, the same election that gives us, um, that puts uh, John F. Kennedy in the White House, uh, gives us 74% uh, Protestants in the Congress and 19% Catholic. Um, so here there's about 100 uh, Catholics that are elected to Congress. That gives us the 19%. Um, and then across time, we see the, the Catholic involvement in politics and in Congress grows a little bit, but it really plateaus. Um, and uh, you can look at this a little bit and see, uh, when Democrats generally do well in elections, so do Catholics. So two-thirds of the Catholics that serve in Congress are, are Democrats. 
So when we look at the 112th Congress, uh, it's 57% Protestant and 29% Catholic. And so Catholics in the United States are about 24, 25% of the population. So we go from being um, uh, less than the proportion of voters that we are to, to, to more. So the idea of Catholics as being insular and not being involved in politics and being highly devotional and rigid, like all of those stereotypes from the early 20th century start falling away uh, to the extent that we now participate in even greater force than, than Catholics did, um, did earlier. And of course there are uh, uh, the percentage of the Catholic population in the United States, right? So it's 23, 24%. Um, so when we talk about uh, Catholic and Catholic positions in politics, we can't, of course, not talk about um, abortion and, and, and pro-life voting records. So this is a list of all of the senators who are Catholic. Uh, this is from a couple of Congresses ago. Um, and then, of course, red for, for Republican and blue for Democrat. And this is the lifetime pro-life voting record. So we see lots of Republicans, a couple of Democrats, another Republican, and then a whole lot of Democrats. So this um, is a survey. Uh, and they, they regularly update this. Um, and when they released it in 2004, Dick Durbin, who is the second ranking Democrat in the Senate, didn't <laughs> like that the only kind of Catholic voting record had to do with pro-life voting. And so what he did was he took a document that I'll be, I'll be talking about a little bit later, um, uh, the, the uh, document put out by the U.S. Catholic Conference, uh, U.S. Um, USCCB, I always get conference and Catholic mixed up. Um, and he took all the issues that they take a position on. So not only life issues, but also welfare and death penalty and education and health care. And he composes his own record and in 2004. And um, he looks at all the votes that they take in the Senate and he categorizes all the senators according to if they vote the, the pro-Catholic position or not. And lo and behold, when he does his entire survey looking at all of these votes that he's chosen, what year did I say? 2004. The person that comes out on top is John Kerry. So he's the best Catholic senator we have, <laughs> according to the Dick Durbin study. He votes with the Catholic Church 60.9% 60, 60 of the time. Of course, Durbin's doing the study. He finishes second with 60.5. <laughs> so there must have been one vote that, that Kerry uh, was there for and, and Dick Durbin wasn't. And according to his calculations, the bottom six were all Republicans, of course, who were voting, which is a much different record than we get. And, and, and we see this played out um, in the way that Catholics practice their politics even today. There's a strong social gospel message among Catholics, and there's a strong pro-life message among, among Catholics. So I want to bring this uh, to, to Pope Francis. And we even see this, this dichotomy of Catholicism, and, and we even see it with Pope Francis. So here's, here's a guy, right? We, we'd like to think of him as not being very political. Um, and yet when he's named, uh, Barack Obama congratulates the Pope on his, on his election um, and views the Pope very much in this vein, right? In, in a Peter vein, if you will, kind of Jesus' friend, like going to console people, going to be that shoulder. Um, this is from the, the Holy Thursday liturgy where he washes the feet of the, of the juvenile delinquents. And, and, and Barack Obama, upon his election, says uh, that as a champion of the poor and the most vulnerable among us, he carries forth the message of love and compassion that has inspired the world for more than 2,000 years. Then each we see the face of God. Right, so this is the way that Barack Obama is going to interpret this guy. Um, we might get a different message from this one. <laughs> so Mitch McConnell sees uh, Pope Francis very much as kind of an authority figure. Uh, what was the term from um, morally uh, um, rigid. rigid? Right. right. <laughs> so here he is with a big Catholic like game plan, and, and so what Mitch McConnell says upon his election as a voice of clarity and force of the great moral challenges of our time. The Pope plays a uniquely constructive role in world affairs. So our politicians are using this guy for whatever message they want to get across. So if it's the, if it's the Peter vision of Jesus and, and the successor of, of, uh, of Peter himself, then we get the Barack Obama message. If it's the Paul, more fundamentalist, Jesus' is savior, uh, we get the, uh, the, the Pope Francis as, as being the moral force in, in our society. So let's look a little bit at the... Um, at the American Catholic Church. So again, here's the structure. So there are various points in which the uh, Catholic Church can um, influence this structure. 
So the first is uh, through the Synod of Bishops. So this is one of those advisory panels for the Pope, comes under the Pope, and uh, the bishops, uh, of course, all come from dioceses. So here are all the dioceses in the United States, the outline dioceses. And then the metropolitan bishops, the archdiocese, if you will, are the color-coded regions. So all of Florida has, has, has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different dioceses, but only one archdiocese in Miami. Uh, Texas, of course, is so big it's got two. So one headed here in, in, uh, in Houston and Galveston, the other one in San Antonio. So both of those are archdioceses. Um, and then all of the other bishops uh, are, are known as suffragan bishops, but I, I, I wouldn't suggest you call them suffragan bishops. They are bishops. <laughs> so 2004 is when this breaks away from the rest of Texas. So it's only in 2004 that Houston becomes an archdiocese, and it's at that point that, um, that Bishop Fiorenza becomes an Archbishop Fiorenza. And when he becomes Archbishop, he of course gets the pallium. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you have Denarda. So the first way that the uh, American church is felt in the Vatican is through the Synod of Bishops. Each one of these, the people having each one of these dioceses sits in that Synod of Bishops. Um, and here are the, I just thought you might be interested in the, all the dioceses in Texas. So in Houston, Galveston, there are 149 different churches in San Antonio, 139. Those are the archdioceses, and then of course Austin is the next biggest with 103, and it gets as, as low as, I guess, Amarillo has the fewest. 41 churches, the parishes in the diocese. Uh, all of the bishops in the United States are part of this United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, and they are the voice for the Catholic Church here in the United States. And this is one of the ways in which we might see Pope Francis truly be a reformist uh, in a way that wouldn't be obvious to people um, in, in the general, uh, in the, in, who don't pay close attention. And that's the that coming out of Vatican II, um, there was lots of power instilled in these national conferences. So it meant something to be in the United States Conference of Bishops. They could really have a lot of say in, in, in what happened to the Catholic Church here in the United States. And, and the, the bishops uh, would think of themselves as brother bishops. And so they would get together and they would try and, and, and do policy. And, and they would even get so far as to be involved in who, who would become bishops. They, they were actually quite powerful coming out of Vatican II. But then slowly but surely, kind of after Vatican II, Rome wants it to again be at the top of the pyramid. So uh, the Vatican, and, and this is through, a lot through John Paul II, um, through uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, who becomes of course Pope Benedict. Um, the relationship to all the bishops is first with the Pope. So they answer to the Pope. They do not have brother bishops in the United States. Of course they do, but their authority and, and their main line of communication is with the Pope. And if the Pope then says, all right, you should talk to X, Y, and Z over here, there, and there, then they can do so. But this whole idea of a conference of national bishops was, was losing steam uh, under John Paul II. And so if, if, if Francis uh, reinvigorates these national conferences, that would be a sign of, 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 of him being uh, a reformist, if you will. Um, of course, the United States Catholic Conference of Catholic Bishops is headed by, by Cardinal Dolan. And for those of you that the, right, read the, the back pages of the Catholic newsletters, it was an upset when he was named uh, the, the president of the, of the conference because there's, there's a pecking order in the USCCB where the person who is supposed to be the next president serves as vice president and then there's, you kind of enter the hierarchy of the four at the bottom rung and you move up each term. Um, so he decided, he would say his brother bishops decided that he should run against the vice president and, and he went. Uh, and that was largely seen as, as, as a rebuke of the more moderate bishops uh, in the United States. Every two years, sometimes four years, um, they put this document out called Forming Consciousness or Fa of Faithful Citizenship. Um, and this is the document that, that Dick Durbin went through, scouring for all of the positions that would be Catholic. And so it, it, it's now as, as long as 50 pages long. Um, where it'll say what, what you should believe as a Catholic when you're casting your political vote. Um, and if you go back and read some of these from the, from the 80s, uh, they'll talk a lot about how you should participate in the process. That was the most important thing that Catholics could do. Of course, holding on to that, that stereotype of Catholics at the turn of the century. But as, as, as the Catholic Church exercises its, its political voice, 
uh, in more strident ways, it, it starts taking pretty firm beliefs about, about policy issues. So the first 10% of this document now is on, is on, on um, uh, issues of revolving life. Um, so it starts with, uh, with abortion, of course, and then euthanasia, capital punishment, um, and then welfare. And then it moves on to other issues, more what, we would, what Dick Durbin would call democratic issues, so health care and education and the environment and labor unions. Um, and uh, this document is fascinating to read. The, the, the church, uh, when it put it out in 2008, um, usually there's great debates about, about its changes that, come in, in, that would have come in 2012. When they meet in 2012 to come up with this new document that's supposed to advise Catholics and how they should cast their votes in the 2012 election, they say everything that we said in 2008 was so profound, we're going to release the same document. We're just going to put a new cover on it. So uh, perhaps uh, Catholic positions are, are, are stabilizing or becoming more solid that we don't need to revisit these issues. Although interestingly, um, for those of you that, that, that might be more moderate or reformist in your views, um, in, in discussing this, they, they started working on a new policy of economics in the document. Um, and it was going off in a direction that lots of old bishops were uncomfortable with. And so Archbishop Fiorenza, our very own, uh, helped put the kibosh on, on the, the rewrite of this economic section, which he thought was emphasizing capitalism too much and not emphasizing poor people enough. Um, and so Fiorenza, who used to be the president of the USCCB um, and has great uh, sway still in the conference, um, helped help stop the rewrite of that part of the document. So the way that the Catholic Church is felt in Rome, First, through the Synod of Bishops. Second, um, through, of course, uh, um, the Secretary of State. Um, and here we have uh, um, Pope Benedict um, receiving uh, a, 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 his resignation from the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Miguel Diaz. So this is just a year or so ago when Diaz leaves the, um, the, the Embassy of the Holy See. And then, of course, we send our ambassadors to the Holy See. The Holy See sends its ambassadors to the rest of the countries. Those are known as papal nuncios. So think of them as nothing more than, than uh, the Pope's ambassadors to the rest of the world. The first uh, papal nuncio, he goes by a different title because of the changing relationship between the American government and the Vatican. But in 1893, this is uh, Francisco Satoli, uh, a good Italian. Um, and he's the first papal nuncio. Uh, our current papal nuncio, um, is uh, Carlo Maria Vigano. Um, and he uh, used to be number two um, in the, uh, in the, he was the Secretary General of Vatican City Governance. And part of his responsibility, part of his portfolio, was um, in charge of the Vatican Bank, which we certainly have been hearing a lot about over the last couple of years. So he was responsible for turning a $10.5 million deficit into a $44 million surplus in just a couple of years. Um, he does this, though, in a way where he upsets lots of people in Rome. <laughs> so he's, he's definitely a reformist, and the Pope is getting lots of blowback from, from lots of different people about his reformist uh, ways. And, and so there starts being lots of, of, of pressure that, that um, the Pope needs to get rid of this guy in charge of the Vatican Bank. And so he recognizes that his job is in jeopardy. And so he sends a letter to the Holy Father. And the letter says, Blessed Father, my transfer at this moment would provoke confusion and discouragement for those who thought it was possible to clean up many situations of, corp of, of corruption and abuse of office. Which is a very public rebuke, right? You just don't do this in Vatican circles. Of course, that, that letter very well may have sealed his fate. Uh, shortly after that, um, so this is in January, uh, in two months, he, he receives his papers to go be the papal nuncio for the United States. I mean, it's hard to say being an ambassador of the United States would be a demotion, but clearly not what he was looking for. And after he's named uh, the papal nuncio for the United States, the, the people in charge of uh, his, his superiors at the time, um, a number of different secretaries and assistant secretaries, release a letter. And their letter says, after careful examination of the contents of two letters, the president of the government sees uh, it as its duty to publicly declare that those assertions are the result of erroneous assessments 
of fears are based on unsubstantiated evidence, even openly contradicted by the main character invoked as witnesses. So again, right, there's, you just don't do this uh, in the Catholic Church. So it's going to be fascinating to see what Pope Francis does with this guy. He would clearly love to go back and be part of the reform effort, but, but whether or not Rome is big enough for him and, and some of the people that he was engaged in this very public tip with will, will remain to be seen. Papal nuncios, turns out, actually are pretty powerful people because in addition to being the post ambassadors for the United States, they're also chiefly responsible for filling vacancies uh, for bishops. So they are the ones in charge with um, putting together the, the portfolios for a number of different candidates for vacancies <coughs> that then go to the congregations and to the Pope for final decisions. So we can think of him as very much kind of the gatekeeper. It's hard to become named bishop unless you get through his door. And just because you get through his door doesn't mean that you'll become a bishop, but it certainly uh, is, is one of the steps that's, that's crucial. So other ways in which the, uh, so we've talked about the Synod of Bishops, we've talked about through the Secretary of State and the relationship between our two governments. Another way that the Catholic Church has felt in Rome is uh, through our cardinals, of course. Um, and there are, there are lots of ways of being named cardinal. Um, I'll first talk about some of the ways in which Americans typically are named and then some of the ways in which Americans typically aren't named. So if you are in the Curia, so usually if you're the head of a curial agency, either one of the congregations, if you're prefect of the congregation, or in charge of one of the other administrative offices, uh, then you can become a cardinal. So the major penitentiary emeriti, so there are two of them that are now American, are, are now American Catholic. We can think of this as one of the lower courts of, in Vatican City. The highest court in the Vatican City is the Apostolic Signatura, and, and the person in charge of that, again, is a prefect, and he is an American. He used to be the Archbishop of St. Louis. So he is a cardinal. He was not a cardinal when he was Archbishop of St. Louis, but becomes one when he becomes the prefect. Of course, uh, we've already talked about Cardinal Aveda, who used to be in charge of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. He is still a member. I should differentiate. If you're in italics, it means that you're past the age of 80. So you're still in the College of Cardinals, you just can't vote in the conclave. Um, so Cardinal Aveda is still under 80, so he still gets to vote. And then the person, uh, a former person who used to be in charge of Vatican City State um, is an American cardinal over the age of 80, so no longer can vote. So that's the curial agencies, but of course also through this College of Cardinals, or no, I'm, I, I don't wonder what's next. Let's see, oh, right. So another way of becoming cardinal is that you can become in charge of one of the major churches in Rome. So uh, the arch priest of St. Paul outside the walls uh, is a cardinal and is an American. Um, the art, uh, Archpriest Emeritus of Santa Maria Maggiore, does anyone happen to know who that is? All right, Cardinal Law. So when he loses his position in Boston, he becomes the chief priest of one of the four papal basilicas. He was a cardinal before he became this, but had he not been a cardinal, he would have become one by being um, the, per the priest in charge of Santa Maria Maggiore. And then the priest in charge of the Holy Sepulchre right now is an American in Jerusalem. And by having the virtue of having that position, this person becomes also a cardinal. So you can become a cardinal by being in the curia, you can become a cardinal by being um, an important, um, uh, by being in charge of an important church. You can also become a cardinal by being in charge of important archdioceses. So if you go back to the first cardinal that was named in the United States, it was actually named in New York, um, and it was 1857 um, was when, and now each succeeding archbishop of New York becomes a cardinal in his own right. Um, there's an interesting thing that happens. All, all bishops have to submit their resignations to the Pope when they turn 75. <coughs> they turn 75, but of course you can still participate in the conclave. So for five years, you, you, you still can participate in the conclave, but you have to submit your resignation. So typically what happens is the new archbishop that, that's named doesn't get to become a cardinal until the previous one turns 80 and is no longer in the conclave. Once it, being a... a a study of the Kremlin or a study of the Vatican, um, it was a huge signal that, that Benedict names um, Dolan a cardinal even before Cardinal Egan reaches the age of 80. So in the conclave uh, that elected Benedict, um, no, they didn't elect Benedict, and Egan is now passing. If it had there been a conclave, there could have been two folks from New York in the conclave. Uh, Baltimore uh, becomes, uh, the, the Archbishop of Baltimore becomes Cardinal in 1886. Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit in 1846, Los Angeles in 1953. 
Washington, D.C. in 1967, and of course our very own Cardinal DiNardo uh, in 2007. And what's been true for all of these archdioceses is that once the, the archbishop becomes a cardinal, each succeeding archbishop becomes a cardinal. And that's if there's a fluky thing about death and, um, and uh, in that 75 to 80 gap. Um, but we think, right, reading tea leaves again, that when the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston became one of those archdioceses that was so important that it's going to get a cardinal, um, that we think the trite has fallen off the map. So Cardinal Maida, uh, past the age of 80, there was a new archbishop that was named, and that person has remained an archbishop, even though Cardinal Maida is now in his mid-80s. So we think that with the promotion of Galveston, Houston, Detroit, my home state, gets demoted. <laughs> so I thought uh, I'd talk a little bit um, about Cardinal DiNardo. Here he is, um, and here's his, uh, here's his coat of arms. So there's a few things that we can tell from this coat of arms, and, and I do this especially for the folks who are going to be in Italy. Um, so he's a cardinal, red hat, right? He has four, la uh, five layers of tassels, which is indicative of, of being a cardinal. Um, I'm going to get these wrong, so I'm going to carry my cheat sheet. Um, this uh, half of his crest uh, is from his home diocese, which is uh, Pittsburgh. So their whole crest would look like I'm wrong. <laughs> Right, because this is the, that's the Lone Star of Texas. So this is a sea of blue, which is reminiscent of the Virgin Mary, and roses, which are for Mary. Uh, the red cross is for the martyrs, and the star in the center is, of course, for the for the uh, state of Texas. So we have to go to this side. The checkerboard is uh, from the Archdiocese of uh, of Pittsburgh, and um, the green is uh, for his mother. His mother's maiden name was Green, so he carries that into his crest. Denardo in Italian means of the nard, of the ointment, and so he has a bottle here that's filled with ointment, so reminiscent of his name, has this, the cross on it, which means it's, it's holy ointment, so it's the ointment that you would receive on confirmation, um, anointing of the sick, uh, it's, the whole, it's the chrism. Uh, here we have the pallium, right, he's an archbishop, so he gets that when he becomes an archbishop, and then the saying is, hail, O cross, our only hope, from and the reason in part that I show this to you is because uh, when we are in Rome, you're going to see lots of churches. In fact, uh, every person who is in the College of Cardinals also has to have a church in Rome, right? Because it's by virtue of them having that church in Rome that they can participate in the election to elect the Bishop of Rome, which of course becomes the, the Pope. And so this is Cardinal Donardo's church in Rome. And I can't say this word. Thank you. Sabius. Is that right? Sabio. Sabio. Um, and so what's true about these churches is they always have two crests. And so they'll always have the, uh, the cardinal's crest and then the pope's crest. So a blow-up picture of this um, is right, Cardinal DiNardo. So a little bit of, of, uh, of Houston right there in Rome. And then the other crest, of course, is, is from Benedict. The, the ways that these differentiate, of course, the keys for Peter, uh, the bishop's tiara, uh, which, of course, Benedict um, uh, even makes even makes less impressive than John Paul, which made it less impressive. Before it was the uh, uh, papal tiara, now it's the bishop's martyr. Um, and then we have uh, the pallium, of course, for, for uh, being an archbishop, uh, which Benedict was. And then we have um, three different symbols, all of which have to do these two have to do with um, Bavaria and Germany, um, and then the seashell, which uh, has a tie-in, uh, we think, with St. Augustine. Um, uh, and, um, and that's, uh, that's the best Benedict symbol. And that's my presentation. Of it, so, did I, I could call it up. It was it, didn't I show it last night? Yep. Who designed those? They do. What, the actual post? Mm -hmm. The actual party on yep. the Yep. I could do one? You could. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think, what was the, Mary, what was the controversy with, with Francis? Cause, well, because he wanted something that was on a crust that can't be on a crust, and he's like, I'm Pope, I think I want that on my crust, and so they put it on his crust. <laughs> it, it was um, purely by the, the ancient laws of heraldry that you can't put the crest on a crust that can't be on a I wanted to say something that doesn't have anything to do with anything. <laughs> 
I was not born in 1900, I want to hasten the point now. But there were some remnants of the, the way people looked at Catholics. I remember in 19, 